Hereby, I open this academic ceremony in which Kim Geurtjens will defend the academic thesis entitled Outlaw Motorcycle Gangs in the Meuse Rhine U Region Exploration of the Phenomenon OMCT Related Crime and the Public Response to OMCTs. Dear candidates, may I invite you to present a summary of your study and the conclusions of your thesis? Yes, thank you very much. Highly esteemed assessment committee, dear colleagues, respondents, friends and family. In 2016, I started my PhD research on OMCG related crime and the public response to OMCG related crime in the Meuse Rhine region. The cross border region, including territories of Germany, the Netherlands and Belgium that we all find ourselves in today. It is a region well known for its cross border judicial and police cooperation initiatives necessary to investigate and curb crimes and public disorder um, with individuals from one country in another. In the years prior to the start of my research, the number of members, chapters and clubs grew immensely. As you can see on the slide, two outlaws members and a friend were murdered by a Hells Angel in Maas Mechelen. The first Dutch Bandidos chapter was founded in the Netherlands, which resulted in ongoing tensions with the previously dominant arch rival Hells Angels and the repeated violent conflicts between Hells Angels and Bandidos members in Aachen transpired. However, clubs like the Hells Angels and Bandidos were not just known for their violent conflicts, but also for organized crime, uh, such as extortion schemes, drug trafficking, and arms trade. At the time, there were general concerns regarding cross-border crime involving OMCG members and violent conflicts between clubs. With so many local chapters from clubs with such a reputation, uh, present in the Meuse Rhine region, the main research question was formulated as follows. What is the role of the national borders for OMCG related crime and the public response to OMCG related crime in the Meuse Rhine region? In other words, does the existence of national borders in this region influence, for example, facilitate um, offending or hamper cooperation by authorities in responding to these OMCG members? This question was examined on the basis of different sub-studies, which tackle the central topic from different angles. That is to say that insights from different criminological theory were used, as well as different data and research methods, including the review of relevant literature and policy documents, uh, a media analysis, interviews with experts, and a case study. And these various sub-studies I will briefly outline for you today. The developments regarding OMCGs and the public response in the Mediterranean region do not occur in a regional vacuum. They are influenced by international and national developments uh, and policy changes. It is therefore important to outline the history uh, of these uh, developments and break down some relevant time periods. The period from the 1970s until the mid 1980s can be characterized as a period in Germany, the Netherlands and Belgium in which uh, outlaw bikers simply gather and ride out together in the first biker clubs and moped clubs. The first Hells Angels chapters were founded in Germany and the Netherlands. Um, and these first clubs were perceived as countercultures. And authorities generally stimulated young adolescents in, uh, to express themselves, even if that included the display of non-conforming behavior. In the time period from the mid 1980s until 2000, the established clubs grew and internationalized. Large clubs, German clubs like the Bones MC, and Ghost Riders MC were patched over to the International Bandidos and Hells Angels. At this time, there was a shift of attention towards organized crime. And as such, authorities became more aware of the risks associated to OMCGs. Overall, the authorities maintained the laissez-faire attitude. The clubs that posed no threat to public order uh, were commonly disregarded and others uh, were most, uh, sorry, uh, were commonly disregarded and the approach to others was mostly incident-based. An attempt of the Belgian Hells Angels to ban uh, the Hells Angels in 2000 failed. From 2000 until 2010, more and more internal as well as external conflicts occurred, and there were several violence, uh, violent incidents in the Mediterranean region as well. 
This is a time where police and judicial authorities were increasingly taking a repressive stance against OMCGs and raiding their clubhouses as well. In the late 2000s, the Dutch authorities' attempt to ban several Hells Angels chapters failed. More and more, the repressive approach focused on criminal law was viewed as unsatisfactory. And as such, the administrative approach was introduced in the fight against OMCGs. Meanwhile, German authorities continued to ban various OMCG, cha OMCG chapters since they did have the legal competences to do so. Lastly, from 2010 onwards, the scene can be viewed in terms of rapid growth. The number of members doubled to quadrupled, which led to tension and conflicts between clubs, but also to internal tensions due to the unbridled influx of new members and frequent switching of members from one chapter or some from one chapter to another from one club to another, something that was previously unthinkable. From a response perspective, it is clear that in this period, the zero tolerance strategy took flight. This strategy included the judicial, police, and administrative component and seeks to prevent and tackle OMCG related crime, reduce opportunities, and hinder their activities. There's also been an increasing focus on banning clubs, changing legislation to make the consequences of a ban more strict and warning civil society about the dangers of engaging with outlaw bikers. So essentially OMCGs have become almost synonymous to organized crime and public disorder. And authorities have increasingly imposed measures to curb and prevent crimes and disorder associated to them. After the historical overview concerning the national developments, a media analysis on regional newspaper articles from 2010 until 2016 was conducted to see what public image appears regarding these OMCG activities and the response to the Mediterranean region specifically. From this analysis, it is clear that the Hells Angels are associated to most criminal as well as non-criminal activities, but more to uh, oriented towards violent crimes. Satudara was associated mostly to organized crimes, such as extortion and drug-related crimes. Bandidas were associated to both, whereas the Outlaws MC was associated to almost none. The articles showed a strong focus on repressive enforcement instruments, such as arrests and raids of clubhouses, and on police surveillance as well. In the Dutch and Flemish part, a wide range of administrative measures were imposed. Various parties, events were prevented by denying or revoking the necessary permits due to fear of public disturbance. And this is really exemplary for the, uh, for the zero tolerance approach uh, from, implemented from 2010 onwards. When looking at the authorities involved in this public response, the most prominent authorities in the three countries are the Public Prosecutor's Office, which is tasked with the prosecution of criminal cases involving OMCG members, the police tasked with gathering intelligence on OMCGs and the investigation uh, of crimes involving OMCG members, and the public administration generally tasked with maintaining public order and safety. On a regional level, these authorities work together on an ad hoc basis, but also in multi-agency cooperation structures, such as the VIEC in the Netherlands, the AGIC in Belgium, uh, and several roundtables in Germany. The goal of this cooperation is that if there are concerns regarding OMCG members or a particular chapter, the authorities can share, combine, and assess their information to see which authority has the best competences and chances of intervening in that particular case. On a cross-border regional level, however, these authorities have mostly worked together in monodisciplinary structures, such as police and judicial cooperation. In relation to cross-border administrative cooperation, the EURIC was only founded in 2019 to analyze cases and develop best practices. But a cross-border multi-agency approach on organized crime phenomena is most likely a future ideal due to the compartmentalization and geographical fragmentation. And with this, I mean that authorities are tackling OMCG related crime while operating in different organizational levels in different regions, um, each with their different priorities, legal competences, work processes and cultures. This fragmentation and the differences between the respective regional approaches led to concerns regarding displacements. When the Dutch courts first banned the major OMCG Cobra Bandidos, uh, on top of their prior multi-agency strategy, while Germany also continued to ban certain chapters, some Belgian authorities feared that OMCG-related problems would relocate to Belgium. The general idea behind these concerns is that by pushing on one side of the border 
and reducing the opportunities for outlawed bikers there, they will pop up on the other side, where the approach is perhaps less strict, the so-called waterbed effect. However, after several interviews with field experts, it was clear that they perceived no structural displacement of either criminal or non-criminal activities. In fact, no examples of actual crime displacement were provided by the experts. The experts did provide some examples um, of events, parties, ride outs, clubhouses being relocated to municipality B when municipality A refused to provide the necessary permit. Or they mentioned that OMCGs, in response to new measures and legislation, changed their patches or their names. And some argued that old members would start a new club to fill the vacuum left by the old one. But it definitely appears that displacement is not inevitable. From the analyze, uh, sorry, the last substantive part of the research relates to a case study aimed at examining the social embeddedness of criminal activities of members of a local chapter. So that is the crimes in relation to the social ties of the offenders, the club and the region. From the analyzed criminal case files and the interviews, um, it appeared that in the interclub conflict that occurred, the club can be seen as a catalyst for offending. Whereas in other offenses, the OMCG mostly provided indirect opportunities, such as contacts or status. The offenders also often knew each other already before some of them joined the club because they were family, friends, or acquaintances from the same region. This arguably led to a limitation of the geographical scope these offenders were able to operate in. Only few offenders could therefore be viewed as international brokers, so basically the big guys in international organized crime. Cross-border drug-related crimes often involved external offenders who also relied on their family and friends to provide a helping hand in the crime. In other words, people from outside of the club seem to play an important role in cross-border offenses, so we should pay more attention to outlaw bikers' broader social surroundings and their networks, rather than only those related to the club. To summarize the main findings of this research, it is evident that OMCGs in the most Rhiney region have been associated by authorities in the media to all sorts of crime, ranging from violent crimes to organized crimes. There have been various conflicts between clubs in the different territories throughout the years, and although outlaw bikers have repeatedly crossed national borders to show support of a foreign chapter, this appears to never have materialized into an actual cross-border conflict. Similarly, although there have been some cases in which members from one country co-offended with members from a neighboring country, um, there were no structural alliances. Members mostly crossed the borders to show support for or visit another chapter, funerals, parties, events, ride outs, and occasionally when hindered in a location in country A, members sought to organize an event or establish a clubhouse in country B. These tensions, conflicts, and criminal cases have led to increased attention from authorities and influenced the implementation of a zero, a zero tolerance strategy against OMCGs. Although the implementation of the strategy differs between the countries, it incorporates judicial and police, but more and more so also an administrative component in trying to tackle and prevent OMCG-related crime, reduce opportunities, and hinder their activities. However, as the case study has demonstrated, outlaw bikers also often rely on their external contacts, such as friends and family, um, for approval or even cooperation in the crimes. So the zero tolerance strategy is therefore too focused on the group as an entity and measures can sometimes even contradict each other in their respective goals. To come back to the central question this research sought to address, what role do the national borders have for OMCG related crime uh, and the response to OMCG related crime in the Mediterranean region? It has become clear that although there may be theoretical opportunities for outlaw bikers to exploit national borders, in practice, no such structural exploitation was observed. From all the data gathered, the national borders mostly seem to influence the public response of authorities. The national borders divide the different regional territories, and in doing so, uh, different respect, they create different respective organizations, priorities, competences, and work cultures. This makes cross-border information sharing and cooperation extremely difficult. Whereas reactive judicial and police cooperation is generally perceived as satisfactory, 
administrative cooperation and proactive information sharing is almost impossible and takes place sporadically. It is therefore unlikely that a multi-agency cross-border response to organize crime phenomena such as OMCGs will, like, uh, will materialize anytime soon. This is a lengthy process with many bumps in the road, but the fact that there are people in the Mediterranean region who continue to pursue such cooperation provides enough reasons to be hopeful for the future. Thank you for your attention, and I'd like to give the word back to the provider. Thank you so much for your presentation. The opposition will be opened by Professor Klipp. Professor Klipp is Professor of Criminal Law, Criminal Procedure, and the Transnational Aspects of Criminal Law, and he's also the Chair of the Assessment Committee. Thank you, Mr. Prorector. The candidate, outlaw motorcycle gang-related crime in the EU region. That's a most interesting and fascinating uh, topic for a PhD student study. I enjoyed very much reading your dissertation and I compliment you and your supervisors with the results of your work. The project focuses on a relevant legal and societal issue, how to respond to outlaw motorcycle gangs in a democratic society. Right from the start, it is clear that, you, that the states in the region, Belgium, the Netherlands and Germany struggle with their law enforcement and it takes a while before they act. Your main research question, which we find on page 29, uh, is relevant and is clearly focused. What exactly is the role of national borders for uh, uh, um, organized motor, uh, outlaw motorcycle gangs related crime and the public response to it in the most Rhine region? With the sub questions, you further zoom in on these, this problem. The problem at hand, the urgency and the methodology of approach has been well de introduced, well designed and explained. I have a couple of questions for you, but I must limit myself. And I will uh, 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 ask you something about the explanation for what you identify as very little cooperation. In reading your study, I see some disappointment about the fact that you found little evidence of concrete law enforcement cooperation concerning what is characterized as a common cross-border problem. This raises the question why that is so. Why is there so little cooperation? I would like you to elaborate on this. Has the need for enforcement cooperation not been felt? Was it attempted and unsuccessful? Or is it related to the fact that in the end, most crimes linked to the outlaw motorcycle uh, gangs are local and do not have a cross-border element. Could it be that this related, uh, this is related to the fact that they have a territory of themselves, or has the problem not been understood as a problem common to various states? It would also be interesting to know whether the practice of banning may have had a drawback on the willingness to cooperate with the authorities at the other side of the border. In other words, You've not been explicit on the on the explanations for lacking cooperation. Could you clarify that now? Um, highly esteemed opponent, uh, I hope I can. Um, as for the question, um, has the the need for cross border cooperation uh, not been felt, or uh, was it uh, attempted but not achieved? Um, I think for one, I, I do explain that reactive law enforcement um, cooperation definitely takes place, um, both for informal uh, for informal cooperation, so people who, who know each other through work processes, etc., um, that share information, but also through the formal, the legal pathways that exist, so through legal assistance and cooperation. Um, but this is always related to reactive. Um, cooperation. Um, in terms of proactive cooperation and information sharing, um, perhaps my assumption was that there was more at the time that was happening, um, because actually when I started in 2016, so I started in March 2016, and I remember actually even being present during a uh, Dutch, uh, uh, the present presidency of the uh, Council for the Europe European Union, where um, there was a, a conference on working apart together, which was on the administrative cooperation between countries. Uh, this was, I think, on the 22nd and the 
3rd of March. And um, this was where the Benelux progress, Benelux plus North Rhine was fairly a progress report that I also mentioned in the PhD, where this was um, shared and um, yeah, also given to the minister. And I remember that actually, I think the specific event where it was provided to the, the Dutch Minister of Security and Justice is when uh, people started receiving phone calls and text messages uh, where they had just heard about the terrorist attacks in Brussels. This was actually that was happen happening on the same day. And I think that this also influenced to a huge extent what happened with OMCG uh, related problems later, um, because you could clearly see that there was um, yeah, a shift of interest basically from OMCGs and maybe also other crime problems um, to radicalization and terrorism. Of course, we've had the Paris attacks also in 2015 and there was the Brussels attacks in 2016 and also in Berlin. Um, and I know that um, actually because when the report was provided to the minister later in 2017, I've also been able to be present in the meetings from the Benelux plus uh, North Rhine Westphalia. Uh, working group in how to establish this cooperation structure that they were uh, yeah, interested in, 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 um, in founding in, in relation to OMCG specifically. Um, but this never materialized, at least not at the time. And I know there were also people involved in this working group um, that actually switched positions at the time, which of course did also not help. Um, so at the time, the, the cooperation structure that they wanted to uh, establish was not, did not materialize. But the people who were involved in the working group uh, later founded the URIC. So in that sense, I think the, the urgency is definitely still there. The urgency to cooperate across borders and the urgency to cooperate in, in administrative, um, for administrative purposes but just not necessarily in OMCGs. And I think that has to do with, like I said, the radicalization and terrorism that came up at that point. Um, but it also has to do with the fact that, well, at least from the, the, the Dutch perspective, I think that at the time the public prosecutor's office was also busy working on the civil case bans. So as I also say in the later reflections in the conclusions chapter, it's almost as if the problem doesn't exist anymore because we don't we don't see it. We don't see them on the streets. They're not wearing their collars anymore. So it's not a it's not a visible problem anymore. Um, which then, if I remember correctly from the second part of your question, does that have anything to do with uh, the cooperation across borders in terms of the the the, the bans that have been imposed? I think. Of course, theoretically, um, it could work both ways. I can imagine that um, that Belgian authorities, um, or sorry, that the Dutch authorities who have actually implemented or imposed the, the bans would see less need for cooperation with Belgium because they have gotten rid of the problem, so to say, or the visible problem at least. Um, and that in that respect, maybe the Belgian authorities would be, yeah, maybe a little bit frustrated about the Dutch approach and not being uh, taken into account in that respect. Um, but I must say that I've never really encountered this in the interviews. So when I did the interviews regarding displacement, it was more or less seen as, yeah, as just a fact to be to be dealt with. This is something that Germany and the Netherlands did, and um, yeah, and that's that, that was just something to be dealt with. Uh, and then in that respect, I also know that at least I don't know how this is between. The Netherlands and Belgium, but I know that there was also some cooperation between Germany and the Netherlands um, in terms of, well, of course, also conferences and expert meetings, um, but also that the the Landeskriminal, the state police uh, of North Rhine Westphalia, also had meetings with the Dutch National Police in terms of the legislation that they were pursuing to uh, for stricter con uh, consequences of the the German bans because they had seen that once they banned the chapter, they would simply pop up elsewhere. And this is something that the Dutch authorities really wanted to prevent. And therefore they said, okay, we, we are going to ban the whole club. So in that respect, there was some cooperation, but just not as much as I would anticipate in the beginning, because as I said, when I entered this meeting and met these people, I thought a lot would be done already. Um, and that wasn't the case. 
The opposition will be continued by Professor van der Beken, who is Professor of Criminology and Criminal Law at the University of Ghent and also a member of the Assessment Committee. And I very much would like to welcome Professor van der Beken to our university today. You have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Poor Rector. Dear candidate, I've read your manuscript with um, a great interest. I think, I believe you've written a um, relevant, topical, and empirically strong um, PhD. You use different methods and techniques. This is something that has to be applauded. I think your PhD answers many questions related to the outlaw motorcycle gangs here in this EU region um, and is a must read for policymakers in, um, in the Netherlands, Germany, and even in Belgium, I would say. Um, your PhD, however, and this however means I come here to applaud your work, but also to ask questions, I have the duty to oppose. It also, well, it provides answers, but also raises questions to me. Um, I've just said that I find your PhD empirically strong, uh, but my question is about the theoretical foundations and ambitions of your work. Um, you write that you use theory as a lens, a uh, pair of spectacles to look at well, your empirical findings. I was a bit puzzled and challenged by that and I had to wait a bit in the PhD to find out what it actually means. Um, and the, you actually say you use a lot, many theoretical lenses, but the rational choice lens theory as the overarching one. In chapter six of part three, the chapter I like most, actually, um, you study the question of displacement, crime displacement. In setting up that study and looking at the results, well, this rational choice theory is very present in your work. You write about it. My question is, however, how useful this lens is. The theoretical frame, rational choice and, and related to that, um, could make you hypothesize to find crime displacement, displacement. But like many other studies, empirical studies, you did not find that. What does this tell you? What does this tell you about the use of your lens? Was this looking back to that? Was this a good lens, actually? Also looking to your other chapters on social embeddedness. Mm -hmm. How happy are you with that lens? Because it didn't help you actually to explain, or maybe it did to explain your findings. So that would be my main question for you. Yes, highly esteemed opponent. Thank you for your question. Um, yeah, I think it, it, it's a it's a very very valid question. Of course, I I, I could have gone a, a million ways with a million different theoretical frameworks, um, but the reason I chose the the rational choice perspective and therefore also crime opportunities and uh, reducing crime opportunities is basically because this is um, also because this is mainly the framework that the government also uses when they look at OMCG. So I really wanted to uh, take that viewpoint and see also the, the underlying assumptions um, of their approach, but maybe also the assumptions that I had in the beginning of my research regarding uh, cross-border activities. Um, yeah, and, and, and to see how, how those two relate to each other. So um, that is the main reason why I chose the rational choice perspective. Um, but of course, I, I could have also used subcultural theories. Um, in the social historical overview, I briefly mentioned uh, Becker, for example. Um, but because this was really a, a study on uh, on, on cross-border uh, criminal activities, non-criminal activities, uh, and the responses, uh, I, I wanted to have one one overarching theoretical lens that, uh, that that could explain the behavior. And in that respect, of course, displacement also um comes around the corner because there you know there's also the assumptions um yeah regarding opportunities that are being thwarted and then criminals uh, going elsewhere to uh, to look for other opportunities um i think the reason that i did not find that or i, I did not find that they uh, actually structurally <laughs> displaced their activities across the border has to do with 
many different reasons, um, because there is also an example in that chapter um, that I outline, uh, which has to do with the Hells Angels in Kerkrade, actually, where uh, apparently, well, this is what the practitioner told me, they actually, um, they, they moved their clubhouse at some point to the marketplace uh, in, in the city center, actually, as a well, middle finger to uh, the public authorities there. So uh, from a rational perspective, that cannot really be explained. So that, that would mostly be something else. Um, and that, that could be something that explains it in, in, this, uh, in this particular case. In other cases, uh, the authorities and the practitioners that I did interview, they also said, well, yeah, this is a clear case. You know, with, for example, Homovok uh, in Belgium, it was very clear that they tried first in one municipality, it was refused. They tried in another, it was refused. Then they tried in, in the Netherlands, they got information from Belgium, it got refused again. Um, so there, of course, they are looking for different opportunities, for different opportunities, just not for criminal activities. Whether or not that is because of rational behavior or not, I simply don't know because I don't have the information. I don't know if there is no crime displacement, OMCG related crime displacement, simply um, because we do not have the information to establish that or because it doesn't take place. Um, so that for me, <laughs> having to conclude that after that chapter is the most difficult thing. Um, but I do think it's very valuable to see um, at least where the pitfalls are, and um, and to also see that it doesn't really structurally happen. So in terms of the people raising the concerns and raising the questions uh, regarding displacement, we can also ask the question, why are they then, um, yeah, why are they mentioning this in the media? Is this, because this is also what someone told me in the interviews, and I don't know if it's correct or not, um, but maybe they, simply also want more competences, more tools, more money for their own approach. Uh, and therefore say, uh, in Germany, they do this in Belgium, or sorry, in the Netherlands, they do that. And we should have those tools as well. Um, that I, I don't know. Um, but overall, the rational choice and crime opportunity theory, I think, is a very helpful, helpful one. Um, in terms of analyzing at least the criminal cases, also in terms of the social embeddedness where I at least try to look at the social networks um, involved, uh, how they operated, how they communicated, uh, which logistics they used in the region, uh, what their reasons might be to do it legitimately or illegitimately. Um, so in that respect, I think it is a very helpful theory, um, but it of course does not explain everything. And in that respect, I think it is very important to also include subcultural theories but it was simply not the theory of choice for this particular PhD uh, research because you want to look at potential reasons of making use of the border in criminal cooperation. Um, so I hope that answers your question. <laughs> then the opposition will be continued by Professor Spapens. Professor Spapens is professor of criminology at Tilburg University and also a member of the assessment committee. He is joining us online today and I would very much like to welcome Professor Spapens to this ceremony. You have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Prorector. Um, and dear candidates, uh, first I would like to apologize for not being able to be present in uh, person in uh, Maastricht. Um, unfortunately, I had some uh, other appointments uh, after this session. Um, so I would indeed like to start uh, with uh, also giving my compliments uh, for this study on uh, OMCGs in the context of the uh, Meuswine Euro region. Uh, and it's actually highly relevant, uh, at least to me, that uh, national borders do play an important role, uh, albeit not as expected uh, beforehand. But of course, a unexpected outcome is also an important uh, result. Um, and your uh, dissertation provoked my thoughts in many different ways. But uh, of course, I can only ask uh, one question, uh, which I will do now. Um, so when I 
was looking at OMCGs, I was always puzzled uh, by the fact that for a long time they have been so successful in uh, presenting a narrative of tough guys with good hearts uh, uh, who were essentially uh, a nice club of people riding bikes together and well some of them might be criminal but uh, we are not a criminal organization as such and they used for a long time quite uh, successful media strategies and uh, of course also philanthropical uh, activities to promote this uh, this image and authorities on the other hand uh, have tried to uh, present the counter frame of groups as criminal organizations, uh, OMCGs as criminal organizations, and maybe not just because of their crimes, but uh, because they challenge the authority of governments, as you gave an example of uh, uh, in your answer to the previous question. So I has, uh, was still left with a bit of a... Um, yeah, with a bit of doubt. So uh, in your opinion, how could we best view um, uh, OMCGs? Are they indeed uh, what they present themselves as? Uh, or is, on the other hand, uh, the counter frame of the governments uh, the most appropriate uh, to describe what OMCGs are and what they do? Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your question. Um, I think you basically asked me the, the the one question I think that OMCG literature has been struggling with for the past years. <laughs> so um, I think it's very difficult to, to answer in, in only uh, just a few minutes, but I will try my best. Um, no, I think absolutely OMCGs have, um, have succeeded for a long time in maintaining this image that uh, they are just a couple of guys riding out together, uh, a brotherhood, um, maybe also, uh, um, yeah, almost a, a surrogate family for, for those who are less fortunate. Um, and they also say, of course, I mean, there, there are quotes from them as well, where they not, necess not necessarily say that they do not engage in, in any type of crime, but where they downplay their role. So they also have different media strategies for that, definitely. Um, on the other hand, you have the authorities in the government who say um, that they are showing the real OMCGs, that they are uh, providing an image of what real OMCGs are and that they are involved in crime, um, that they're involved in serious types of crimes, and that people should definitely um, be, wearing, be wary of engaging uh, with outlaw bikers. Um, the truth is probably somewhere in the middle, as unsatisfactory as that may seem, um, because, well, as most of, at least the, the most recent literature in OMCG, uh, in, the, in the field of OMCGs, has also stipulated that, um, well, one club is not the other, so Hells Angels is not the Bandidos, Satudara is not Outlaws, etc. So, uh, this is also something that is very visible from the, the, the media analysis. And although it is a, a very uh, small analysis, you can see that in the Mediterranean region, the clubs are associated to different types of crimes, um, different frequencies as well, uh, different types uh, of media attention that they got uh, with this or the way it was responded to. Um, so one club is not the other. Um, but of course, you can distinguish between the large in international OMCGs, such as Hells Angels, Bandidos, uh, Outlaws, for example. Well, Satudara is an originally Dutch club that has expanded the national borders and has uh, really caused a lot of trouble in Germany, which is why they were banned relatively soon after. Um, and smaller clubs, because of course, there are also still a lot of national clubs. And I think this is also a little bit where the problem is with these shortlists or blacklists or whatever you call them that the government is making because at some point in the Netherlands there was also this issue with the veterans MC being on the shortlist of the the Dutch uh, yeah the Dutch OMCG shortlist saying these are outlaw motorcycle gangs these are the ones that we target with a zero tolerance strategy and um, there were also in the in the media there were these cases of veterans who were part of veterans MC um, who didn't get their yeah, royal uh, insignia um, being handed by the mayor because the mayor said 
this is a member of an OMCG and I'm not going to be present to put them on a pedestal there. Uh, whereas the veterans already mentioned multiple times, we should not even be on the list because we're not, we're not on there with the Hells Angels. We're not, we're not criminals. So they are, we are not. Um, and actually after this happened, so the mayor refused to, to give this to him in person. And actually after that, they were taken off the list. Um, so even though it may seem as only a small incident, I, I can imagine at least for these people, it has a huge impact. And in that respect, I think we should always look at the situational circumstances. Um, and these may differ, like I said, between clubs, but also between chapters of one club, because one chapter here in the region may be entirely different from a chapter in, in, a, in another region. There may be a lot of criminals involved in chapter A, but not as much uh, or as many in chapter B. Um, and this can also change over time, I can imagine, where, um, I don't know, let's say there is a criminal chapter, uh, there's a large criminal case, a lot of bikers have been locked up, some of them, you know, have, have not been involved in those crimes, are still outside, want to pursue their, their club life, um, they ask other people, and then all of a sudden you get this chapter that goes from super criminal to maybe not even that criminal anymore, so this is kind of why I I would say, well, it, it's maybe formulated a little bit black and white, but why I have problems with these kinds of lists. Um, although I do understand the reasoning behind them, um, but I think that for each chapter in a particular uh, moment in time, you would have to see uh, which members are involved and in what kind of crimes they are involved. Um, because, of course, we have studies in the Netherlands that say that uh, I think over 80% of the outlaw bikers in the clubs have criminal records. But then that doesn't necessarily say that they, uh, that they were involved in drug, drug trafficking. It can also be a, a speeding limitation or, or something else. Uh, and I think it's very good that there are a lot of super capable uh, Dutch researchers doing research on this and seeing uh, how this actually relates to the different typologies there are, et cetera, um, so that we can really see what kind of criminal careers these outlaw bikers also have. Um, and I think that is very important to assessing the situation. Um, Thank you so, Thank you yeah. so much. <laughs> <laughs> the opposition will now be continued by Dr. Yates. Dr. Yates is Associate Professor in the Department of Criminal Law and Criminology at our university and also a member of the Assessment Committee. Thank you, Prorector and dear candidate. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to read this well-considered research. I found the topic fascinating and I found your approach to be both varied and practical, which should be commended. I also believe that this work has interesting impact and that is where my question lies. So my question is in the bigger disciplinary picture of this research and specifically how your research contributes to larger criminological understandings of transnationality. It seems at times that at least in your mind, you've limited the scope of your research impact to this one small and in some ways unique region. This is even reflected in the impact statement that accompanies your book, which seems to confine your impact locally. To me, your work fits very well within the developing subfield of transnational criminology and the wider uh, study of transnationality and crime. You draw on this literature a bit, but you seem to fall short of placing your own work within it. I see your work as uh, having a lot to offer to this subfield. So my question is then, do you see your impact and conclusions really to be regional? Or can you see them fitting into these larger disciplinary discourses on transnationality? Yes. Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your question. Um, I think that um, some of the implications of my research are, are or may be valuable to other regions as well. Um, but of course, because I, well, I looked at the most Rhine uh, region specifically, uh, I, I looked at the, the national international developments leading to the situation here, basically. Um, I think the same might be true for other uh, uh, cross-border regions or, yeah, 
any 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 type of region in the sense that um and then i come back to a, a previous answer that i also gave in response to the the rational choice perspective is that i think it is mostly helpful in the sense that um this rational choice perspective is really well taken as a vantage point i think by most uh, government, so the, this kind of like risk aversion, uh, crime control policies, um, and therefore also uh, an, an, uh, more and more implications for the administrative approach and administrative cooperation in that sense, um, as is also visible, as I said, from the Benelux uh, plus North Rhine Westphalia uh, working group, the fact that the URIC has been uh, established here uh, in the Meuse Rhine region, but I believe they also operate. Uh, along the Dutch and German borders. Um, so I think that is definitely a relevant development um, to, to take into account and where this research can serve as some inspiration uh, to see how it happens or how this occurs in, in different regions. Um, so how the cooperation is there, if there is any type of administrative cooperation uh, and, and how that works in that regard. Uh, in terms of transnational crime and the frameworks that exist in transnational crime literature, um, I felt I could not deduce more from my findings because um, it was very difficult to get access to information, or at, at least that's how I perceived the, the whole uh, research endeavor, um, which is also why I named that one of the yeah, main conclusions actually of, of the research. Um, because actually in the beginning, I remember I had a, an interview with one of the respondents and we were just kind of brainstorming of how um, cool it would be to uh, have, for example, one OMCG chapter and list all the members and then go to the Netherlands and say, tax office, police, this, 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 like all of the authorities. I want all the information you have on these persons and then go to Belgium and then do the same thing and go to Germany, do the same thing and uh, to see, do they have cars registered in in, uh, in a neighboring country? Are they involved or have they been involved in other crimes with which networks? Are they international? Are they local? Are they regional? Are they, you know, all of, uh, all of these kinds of frameworks that are used in transnational organized crime also in relation, of course, to logistics and how the borders are used. But I simply did not have um, that information um, so, in that respect, I felt like at least the, the conclusions that I could make, for example, from the social embeddedness chapter or the displacement chapter, um, that my conclusions were limited to this region, but I can imagine that the way I set up the study or um, in terms of, like I mentioned, the, the developments regarding more and more risk aversion and the administrative approach, I think this is really something that we're going to see a lot more in the future, because for police and judicial cooperation, there are frameworks, there is cooperation, there, there are legal frameworks in place that arrange when legal assistance can take place and how that happens. And we have the IRC, we have um, all these kinds of cooperation structures, but for the administrative approach and especially the cross-border administrative approach, it's just a lot more difficult because with police and judicial cooperation, of course, there's a crime, there's a suspect, there is a certain threshold that has already been met, whereas with the administrative um, approach, it's about the prevention of organized crime in a very earlier setting, let's say. So it's uh, it's a little bit more difficult in terms of what information you can get um, for a researcher, but as well, of course, for the practitioners uh, and how you can use that information uh, to cooperate across borders. And of course, if they don't have that information, because it's not available, because they're not allowed to share it, then it's also most of the times not available to research. So you're really dependent also on, on what they give you and what they can give you. Thank you. The opposition will now be continued by Dr. Hoffman. Dr. Hoffman is assistant professor in the Department of Criminal Law and Criminology and also a member of the assessment committee. And also Dr. Hoffman is joining us online for this. Ceremony. I think that you should still unmute before. Yes.
this is working. Yes, thank you, Prorector. Dear candidate, um, first of all, let me congratulate uh, on your impressive piece of work. Uh, your dissertation constitutes an important contribution to the research on organized crime and on motorcycle gangs in particular. Um, you engaged into a thorough analysis of this topic and applied an innovative and largely convincing approach to the main uh, and current problems we're facing with related forms of crime. Um, the text is exceptionally well written, accessible to the reader, and it was simply a pleasure to read it. My question to you is this. Um, many of the law enforcement instruments you describe in your thesis um, are discussed in recent years under the controversial concept of undermining. Describes how organized crime is increasingly infiltrating the legal economy and society as a whole. One dimension of the law enforcement strategies in all three countries has been to increasingly involve the private facilitators of organized crime in the fight against this phenomenon. How successful do you deem this strategy um, given the current developments in the Dutch underworld? Which are the downsides to it? And um, what is the role of state borders with regards to this strategy? Esteemed opponent, thank you for your question. Um, if I understand correctly, uh, you're asking me if the instruments that they are using in uh, the current uh, undermining, uh, yeah, undermining uh, subversive crime uh, policies, um, to what extent uh, I believe they're, they're successful for the Netherlands and also in relation to, to cross-border tackling of these problems. Yes. Um, in that case, in that case, um, I think the the instruments used uh, by by the Dutch government um, are are in fact very useful um, because well I mean at least for for most of the crimes that fall under the umbrella of undermining uh, or subversive crime let's say because yeah I mean of course even authorities in the Netherlands use different definitions of what undermining actually is. Um, but if, if we're talking about drug production, um, drug trade, arms trafficking, uh, extortion, uh, sorry, extortion and money laundering, etc., of course, these are crimes that you could uh, easily uh, cut up in terms of uh, crime logistics processes and then raise barriers as the, the Dutch approach has done uh, for many years already. So in that regard, I think it is very useful. Um, in the matter of OMCGs, I was not as convinced, although I do understand the reasoning. Um, the, the OMCGs were mostly targeted as a group, so um, they were really targeting the, the group characteristics as well and not necessarily the crimes in terms of the, the process. So I would say the uh, instruments used in the mining and also in terms of facilitators, which of course OMCGs can be facilitators uh, for uh, organized crime in terms of extortion, because of course they have the status, they have the contact uh, contacts, they have uh, or had at least their uh, their patches and their colors uh, with with which they could um, with which they had an intimidating presence. Let's say um, so to to take those away, I think in itself is not necessarily even a bad idea. Um, of course, it can also help uh, hamper facilitators. Uh, if, if we look at OC OMCG specifically, uh, where OMCG members may use external offenders, being in this case facilitators, as you mentioned, um, who, who try to, I don't know, um, acquire a location for home cultivation, for example, or where they gather certain tools or have certain expertise. I think that is very helpful. And I think that is also one of the main points from the, the social embeddedness chapter that it is very important to look also at the external factors and the external offenders uh, in the um, involved in crimes where also OMCG members are involved um, and how this relates across borders. Um, I think it might be a little bit more difficult because at least to my knowledge on the on the mining subversive crime is really something that is now a hot topic in the Netherlands and has been for a couple of years. Um, but this basically started or really took flight after my data collection ended. So I didn't look at OMCGs as 
in, in terms of undermining per se. Um, but I can imagine for cooperation across borders, it's more difficult because it is a term that we as Dutch practitioners and academics cannot even agree on. So how would we expect our German or Belgian or other counterparts to uh, have the same understanding of what is undermining crime uh, and how we should tackle this. So I think that is a little bit more difficult. If we can agree on a definition, if we can agree on what crimes um, we are talking about, then yes, but I don't necessarily think that the term undermining is very useful in that regard. The instruments, yes, the term not so much. Thank you. The opposition will now be continued by Professor Bollen. Professor Bullen is professor of cross-border pension tax law at our university. You have the floor. Yes, <clears throat> thank you, Prorector. Dear uh, candidate, dear Kim. Um, first of all, I would like to congratulate you um, with the work you have uh, done. And as of uh, item, we are very uh, proud with the results of this because um, what we are really looking into is uh, how can we put fundamental and, and uh, scientific research uh, into uh, uh, the benefit of uh, society and how can we make society profit out of it. So I'm very happy on, uh, on that research. Um, and one of the domains we are also looking into is, uh, of course, uh, safety. Um, in your research, you show that, um, that there are extra challenges in case of uh, national borders in the neighborhood of like well, Germany and, Bel and Belgium, of course, and more precisely the news, uh, news Rhine uh, new region. Um, you have concluded that criminals benefit more and faster of the freedom of free, free movement within uh, the internal market than the legal authorities can create contract power via legal re restrictions and cross-border collaborations. And although the reactive police, uh, police uh, and judicial cooperation generally goes well, there are still some barriers to overcome in the area, such as proactive and administrative information sharing, as you also mentioned um, in the first uh, part of this uh, ceremony. According to your research uh, findings, there is a lack of national legislation and regulation, which gives a clear overview of the information that can be exchanged in cross-border situation. More specific, there's a need to know under which circumstances and with what aim exchange of information should be allowed. Besides the question, which authorities are allowed to exchange this information? Due to national borders, you don't foresee on short term an uniform approach within the region most right. So the national border hinders the proactive exchange of information between the judiciary, the police and administrative authorities. You recommend that the professional field has to act actively start making integrated cross-border crime image analysis in order to get insights about the role of the national border in relation to various types of crime, criminal uh, offenses, or the non-criminal uh, criminal activities of the OMCGs. This brings me to your fifth proposition, which reads as follows. Formal pathways and legal arrangements must be implemented based on cross-border cooperation needs, cooperation needs of those working in the field rather than the other way around. You see a major role for the professional field. Apparently, a bottom-up approach should be used to map out the cross-border cooperation needs. On that basis, formal pathways and legal arrangements should be implemented. I reach a proposition that a top-down approach is not the right approach. I would like to know which organizations or bodies in the professional field should fulfill a formal role in order to have a successful bottom-up approach. At least, I assume, uh, someone has to be in charge and in control. And do these organizations or bodies have sufficient perseverance to translate the findings of the analysis into formal pathways and legal arrangements? Or should, at the same time, investments be made in the top-down approach, in particular, to create that needed perseverance. If so, for which bodies and persons in this top-down approach do you see a role? If you look again at your Proposition 5, shouldn't your statement be adjusted and take the importance of the combination of bottom-up and top-down as a central starting point? I'm looking forward to hear your answer and reconsiderations. 
highly esteemed opponent. Thank you for your question. I think it, this is a very interesting, uh, uh, very interesting vantage point, and I, uh, I agree with you. I can be very, <laughs> can be very short on that. A little bit of the longer answer is that. Um, I think actually a, a lot in the past has been done uh, top down. I don't necessarily think that it doesn't work, but I've also seen in interviews that um, that there is a, also a little bit the feeling of, yeah, this is just something that we have to do and God knows why. Uh, so in in that respect, I think it is very good. And I think previous research in the Mediterranean region has also stipulated that, stipulated that re, uh, repeatedly that these things should happen and, and blossom bottom up because the people who are working in the daily practice are seeing uh, the problems more clearly than, than the people on top. So let's say maybe from uh, the ministry or the league or uh, these kinds of organizations, if I'm talking about the Dutch situation, by the way, because I can imagine it being different for, for, for Belgium with High Sider or uh, Germany with the National State Police. Um, so that also relates to the different organizations in uh, the countries that are working on this topic. You may briefly conclude your reply, if yes. you like. Yes, thank you. Um, so, um, so I felt it was important to stipulate that these things uh, should happen uh, bottom up because of course these are the people that have to work with it and with these people I mean people in municipalities uh, in the Netherlands, Belgium uh, and Germany um, who also have their representatives in for example Ari Krieg in the roundtable structures so I think those would be the structures or the organizations where these these bottom up things should happen which is also uh, to an extent what happened with the Eurik so I'm very happy about that. Um, we should not exclude the 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 top-down uh, approach, but I really think it is important in a, in a cross-border region such as the Mediterranean region that there is also a lot of um, yeah context for the uh, for the the bottom-up approach because in the end those people are the ones that will have to implement the the policies and impose the measures and do the actual cross-border cooperation. If there's no capacity, if there's no time, if, yeah, then it's just very difficult to uh, to maintain that policy on the long term. Yes. Dear candidate, the time appointed for defending your thesis has passed. The degree committee, here present, will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and the quality of your defense. And I request that you and your company await the results of our deliberations and our return in this room. Sebas, buts die andere hoogleraar even naar de breakout in.
In Gertjens, the degree committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and the quality of your defense. In view of its positive verdict, and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Professor Naden is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom. And I now invite your supervisor to take the floor. Belooft u dat u altijd volgens de beginselen van wetenschappelijke integriteit te werk zult gaan, eerlijk en zorgvuldig, transparant, onafhankelijk en verantwoordelijk. Dat beloof ik. Krachtens de bevoegdheid, ons door de wet toegekend volgens het besluit van de commissie, die tegenwoordig, verklaar ik hierbij u, Kim, Katharina, Petronella, Geurtjens, tot dokter te bevorderen, en uw alle rechten te verlenen die daaraan volgens wet en gewoonte zijn verbonden. Ten bewijs hiervan overhandig ik nu de bul door de rector, secretaris en overige leden van de commissie ondertekend en met het grootzegel van de universiteit bevestigd. Geachte dokter Geurtjens, beste Kim, de klus is geklaard. Ik zou zeggen, de bevalling is goed verlopen. Nog niet de echte gelukkig, dan zou iets te vroeg geweest zijn. En dan hadden de paren in ook nog echt de handen uit de mouw kunnen steken. Maar de overdrachtelijke bevalling in de zin van een proefschrift van een geesteskindje, wat je altijd zeer na aan het hart heeft gelegen. Het werk naar de OMG's. De regio Maasrijn. En uh, nou, wij, Miet en ik, zijn eigenlijk bijzonder onder de indruk geweest van hoe je door de jaren in dat hele traject gemanifesteerd hebt. Je doorzettingsvermogen, je toewijding, um, je enthousiasme. En laten we ook vooropstellen dat de lijn is niet altijd helemaal 
mooi gelopen van wat we oorspronkelijk in gedachten hadden naar het boek dat het nu ligt. Dat geldt voor meerdere promotietrajecten. Maar je hebt onderweg toch denk ik wel wat hobbels meegemaakt die de boel behoorlijk hebben beïnvloed. Daar heb je altijd met heel veel verven doorheen geslagen, heel veel doorzettingsvermogen aan de dag gelegd. En uh, petje af, namens ons alle twee, hoe je dat hebt volbracht. Kijk, je refereerde net ook al even in je eh, antwoorden aan het idee wat we ooit hadden, en zo is het eigenlijk ooit begonnen, van een soort van, nou ja, tegenwoordig zou het een field lab noemen, dat jij te midden van een aantal analisten zou gaan zitten, politiemensen vooral, maar ook mensen van andere diensten, je refereerde onder ook naar de fiscus, alle partijen die bij elkaar zouden brengen, die informatie gingen delen, en dat we gingen kijken hoe wordt eigenlijk tussen die chapters, die bij wijze van spreken zes kilometer van elkaar liggen, die jongens kennen elkaar, zijn die actief, kunnen we daar een sociale netwerkanalyse op lossen, want iedereen was enthousiast, alleen één partij helaas niet, dat bleek de Nederlandse politie te zijn. Die hadden daar hun redenen voor, maar dat was wel heel jammer, want het idee, we waren ver gevorderd, Belgische autoriteit, heel enthousiast, dat lukte allemaal net niet, moesten we het anders doen, plan B, gingen we andere dingen doen. Ik denk dat op basis van, je hebt het geschetst ook in je presentatie, de middelen, de methode die je hebt gebruikt, heb je een geweldig goed proefschrift gezegd, maar het werd wel anders dan we ons voor hadden gesteld. En ook hoe we dat moesten gaan doen dan. Want ook een idee wat we hadden was, we gaan het baseren op artikelen. Dus lange tijd hebben we, en dat heeft misschien ook tot reden gehad, dat je niet koos voor één specifieke theorie waaruit je vertrok, maar dat je verschillende aspecten benadrukte, of benaderde, vanuit ook verschillende theoretische perspectieven. En die rational choice hing er altijd al overheen, maar die was er niet alleen. Nou, ook daar ontmoet je, op, omdat het had te maken ook met de data die we hadden, uh, maar ook gewoon heb je denk ik in een aantal opzichten een beetje pech gehad, met name als het ging om uh, het, het reviewproces, wat ontzettend waardevol is in de criminologie, dat dat vooropgesteld zijn. Peer review is een groot ding, moeten we vooral koesteren, maar het heeft ook bepaalde kanten die jij helaas mee moet maken. Dat je in een situatie belandt waar je eigenlijk feedback krijgt van reviewers, waarvan je denkt, ah, heb je het verhaal goed doorgrond en goed begrepen? En als je daar dan op reageert, dat ook een editorial board zich nogal makkelijk achter die reviewers opstelde. En dat we een beetje vastkwamen te zitten ten aanzien van zo'n artikel waar we zeiden, ja, hoe moet dat dan? Want men, nou goed, daar heb ik me zelfs nog druk over gemaakt, zoals je weet, in de richting van het desbetreffende journal. Maar goed, op een moment dachten we ook van dat, kijk hoe mooi een peer review proces ook is, en hoe waardevol het ook is. In dit geval zie je ook wel de keerzijde van, kan het frustreren? Kan het zelfvertrouwen aantasten, zeker van jonge onderzoekers. Waarvan we op een paar moment dachten, nou, dan wordt het, een, dan wordt het een, een molensteen die om je nek gaat hangen. En toen dachten we ook om een aantal andere redenen, eigenlijk het materiaal wat je hebt, leent zich gewoon heel goed voor dat boek. Dus we kunnen het, maar goed, om je daarvan te overtuigen, want toen waren we al zo ver heen. Ik denk dat tamelijk cruciaal was, herinner ik me tenminste, een wandeling die wij twee hebben gemaakt door Maastricht. In de coronatijd konden we niks. Alleen maar online. Dus we dachten, weet je wat, we gaan Maastricht eens verkennen. We zijn helemaal door Maastricht gegaan. En we hebben hier toen over gesproken. Dat zie ik nog steeds als een cruciaal kantelpunt. Waarvan je eigenlijk langzaam maar zeker toch van overtuigd raakte. Het kan. Het is wel werk. Maar goed, nogmaals, als je nu kijkt, geweldig gedaan. Dus heel mooi. Goed, dus je hebt die, die uh, om een keer moeten maken. Je had ondertussen, nou goed, ook fysiek gezien. Wat last van een een en ander, behalve je, nou, je rug heeft je gewoon enorm apart gespeeld. Nog een, ik moet zeggen, een wonder dat je nog een heel uur zo hier ook weer goed overeind blijft staan. Maar goed, we weten allemaal, daar heb je nodig mee te stellen gehad. Uh, maar ondertussen, daar hebben we aanpassingen op gepleegd. Je hebt een tijdje minder gewerkt, we hebben het contract wat aangepast. Maar je bleef wel ontzettend betrokken en het is nooit een punt geweest dat ik bij jou geproefd heb. Nou, ik hou er mee op. Dat had ook gekund, want het is me te veel. Nee, in tegendeel, je ging door. Sterker nog, je hebt ook nog meegedaan aan een aantal andere projecten. We hebben samen Frontière gedaan. We hebben, dat was het project in Maastricht. De, drugs, de aanpak in Maastricht van de drugsproblematiek. We hebben Kim en ik uitvoerig geëvalueerd. Dat was een hartstikke leuke studie. Zo ook het project Eva op, waar we met Roland, met de collega's van Rotterdam, die misschien wel meekijken, wie weet, online, volgens mij waar is dat wel van plan. Maar was voor jou extra leuk, omdat je daar je bachelor criminologie hebt gedaan. Dus in Rotterdam je bachelor gedaan. En ook nog in het kader van dat project wat we doen. In het kader van aanpak ondermijning. Dat je daar ook nog een bijdrage aan kon leveren. 
En dat deed je altijd zo met enthousiasme, goed vermutst, ontzettend zorgvuldig. Ik denk dat die projecten ook heel belangrijk waren om voor jezelf ook het gevoel te krijgen. Luister eens even hier. Nou ja, bevestig je gewoon in, in wat je eigenlijk al wist. Ik kan gewoon correct goed onderzoek doen. Wat je hier al liet zien, maar wat nog eens bevestigd werd in die andere projecten ook. Uh, en dat altijd met die enorme positieve instelling merkte je ook als wij met uitjes, als we erop uitgingen uh, met de club criminologen. We zijn er eens naar een escape room geweest, uh, herinner ik me. En daar kwamen we alles niet op tijd uit. Maar goed, ook andere activiteiten. We gingen, je deed altijd enthousiast mee bij ook uitjes van de kapgroep, graffiti schuiten, vlaaien bakken, uh, nou, stormbaantjes, wat al niet meer deden we. Maar goed, jij was er altijd bij en vooraan ook. Dus dat was hartstikke goed. En nou, dat geeft ook wel aan die instelling die je hebt. En die merkte ik trouwens ook toen ik nog eens naar de mailtjes keek. Af en toe doe ik dat nog eens. Ik bewaar nog wel eens wat. En dan zie je zo. En dan de titels van die mailtjes waren wel leuk. En dan kwam al van, hè hè, weer vooruitgang geboekt. Of een andere was, al het goede komt in drieën. En toen kwamen er een paar mooie dingen. Want al het goede in drieën. Toen konden die ineens een aantal dingen tegelijk achter elkaar aan. Dus nu zitten we al redelijk ver in het traject. Want toen konden die aan, ik heb een nieuwe baan. Dus we hadden zoiets, oh, kijk eens aan. Nou, en ook dat was trouwens mooi, want zit uit geleen, OOV, waar je nu werkt, collega's zitten daar. Maar daar heb je een hele goede aan. Uh, maar de, het leuke was dat je daar natuurlijk eigenlijk in je stage, ten tijde van de Master Forensica, dat je daar stage ging lopen, dat je daar een onderzoeksproject deed en dat je nu via een route weer terug bent. Nou, hartstikke goed is dat. Nou, het tweede mooie nieuws was natuurlijk het feit dat jij en Jur hadden een prachtig huis gevonden in Rosmalen. Moest nog wel worden gebouwd, maar dat is inmiddels volgens mij, uh, <tossimus> dat is allemaal mooi achter de rug. Volgens mij moeten er nog een paar plintjes gelegd. En uh, nou, het derde goede nieuws had betrekking toen op het proefschrift, want je ging natuurlijk het laatste goede nieuws ging je niet via de mail vertellen, maar dat heb je ons later verteld. En wij hopen dus inderdaad over een tijdje, over een paar maanden, ook daar nog. Hele mooie berichten over te ontvangen. Maar goed, dat even. Tot slot, ik wil nog iets zeggen over de proefschrift en waarom het toch zo belangrijk is. Je hebt al vanuit de commissie ook een aantal hele positieve dingen meegekregen van waarom het belangrijk is. Ik denk zo academisch als ook maatschappelijk. En een van de belangrijke dingen die ik altijd heb gevonden is dat je ook in het proefschrift een aantal dingen demystificeert. Beelden die we hebben, zo zitten die groepen in elkaar. De neiging die we hadden voortdurend om die groep als één, als één entiteit te zien... Dus dat als het ging om georganiseerde misdaad, we er eigenlijk vanuit ging dat al die jongens in zijn ene chapter zijn even actief als het gaat om de drugshandel. Nou, zo zit die wereld niet in elkaar. Een van de dingen die heel nadrukkelijk in jouw proefschrift naar voren komt. Een ander ding, we veronderstellen als het ene land gaat duwen, in ons geval Nederland, gaat civielrechtelijke verboden opleggen, dan zal dat wel onmiddellijk tot verplaatsing leiden. Dat is natuurlijk interessant. Je bent gaan kijken, zoeken. Hebben we daar überhaupt concrete aanwijzingen voor? Nou, je hebt ze niet gevonden. Kan verschillende verklaringen hebben. Kunnen we nog op doorgaan. Maar dit soort noties is van belang. Want we kunnen ons allemaal meteen wel in dat perspectief verplaatsen. Van met name wat overheidsinstanties naar voren brengen. Maar dat is ook de rol van de wetenschap. Om daar af en toe eens bij stil te staan. En ook een aantal dingen te ontzenigen. En te laten zien. Oké, okay, dat is een veronderstelling. Maar wij vinden er weinig empirisch bewijs. Ik denk daar zitten een paar hele mooie voorbeelden in jouw boek. Goed, genoeg gezegd. Ik nogmaals van harte gefeliciteerd namens Miet en mijzelf. Het was een ontzettend voorrecht, ontzettend leuk om jou te begeleiden in dit traject. En zoals gezegd, het ging hier allemaal misschien even in die rechte lijn. Maar uiteindelijk was het ook met z'n drieën gewoon denk ik heel goed. De samenwerking was geweldig leuk. Dus ik zou zeggen, laten we nu vooral genieten. Laat ik ook Jur erbij betrekken. Laat ik je familie, je ouders, je zus, alle andere mensen, collega's in zit uit geleen. Van harte feliciteren. Volgens mij gaan we zo gezellig het glas heffen. Maar bij deze al van harte gefeliciteerd nogmaals. Dear Dr. Geurtjes, also on behalf of the Board of Deans at the University and the Faculty of Law, many congratulations on the degree you just acquired. As you know, it's the highest degree we have available at this university, and you earned it thanks to your uh, hard work. So many congratulations on that. Also, congratulations to your family and friends, and of course, to your uh, two supervisors. Um, I also like to thank Professor Spapens and Professor van der Beken to join us here in this, uh, uh, in this committee. Thank you uh, so much. 
um, there will be a reception that is going to take place in the Refter, and I indeed would like to, on behalf of you, invite everyone present here in this aula to uh, join us for that reception. We will still stay behind for just a few more minutes right here in this room to take the traditional photo of the uh, young doctor with her paradigms, um, with her supervisors and with her committee, including our two members uh, uh, online. Um, and with this, I close this academic ceremony.